This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. At this point, we just got to accept that Patrick Mahomes is the boogeyman. I was on the 49ers for last night's game and did not feel great the entire game. Didn't feel good at the end either, but it is fun to see a dynasty in action. It's fun to watch players as great as Patrick Mahomes, coaches as great as Andy Reid, get rewarded for how good their process is and all the success that they've had. So a bummer to lose money, but still a pretty fun game to watch and and a delight to watch this Chiefs dynasty in full swing. But I think beyond that, there are some key takeaways from last night's game and the entirety of this 2023 NFL season. So I want to spend today going back through what I noticed during yesterday's game, not talking about like individual teams and stuff like that, but like overall process-based holistic stuff and talk about how we can apply that to betting when we get to the 2024 NFL season. So hopefully learning from my losses uh, last night to make things better for 2024. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Here to recap all the key takeaways from Super Bowl 58 for last night. Just talking through key things that we can learn from betting this year's Super Bowl and I guess the entirety of the 2023 NFL season as well. Three key takeaways from me that I think are worth implementing when we get around to NFL once again in months, uh, which is unfortunate to think about, but hey, uh, it'll be here before you know it as it always is. We'll dive into all that here in just one second, but first, we are still here Five days per week on the Covering the Spread podcast feed, despite the fact it is no longer NFL season. Tomorrow, we're going to take a look at the NFL draft, take a look at the early betting markets for that. Wednesday, Daytona 500 discussion coming up with Dr. Nick Giffen of the Action Network. So we're still here five days per week getting you ready. Talking betting right here on this stream. We're on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Make sure you're subscribed to that wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or over on Spotify. You can also find this show in entirety every single day on the FanDuel YouTube page and over on FanDuel TV+. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit the FanDuel app and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sports book partner of the NBA, must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only, $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and Vermont. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IN Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Let's dig in now to the three key takeaways I had from betting at Super Bowl 58. Now, line, what should you do about them heading into 2024? And this one is not just specifically from last night's game, but also more broadly, the public money doesn't matter. What the public is betting doesn't really matter. You'll often hear analysts talk about what the public is betting. And the thought process they want to tell you is that bookmakers tend to win so they can bait the public into betting one side. And that is true to an extent because bookmakers are very smart. They're good at what they do and they want to win money. So they can put a bad number up there and get everyone to bet it. They would do that. But with how much good money there is in the market, they can't hang a bad line up there and not expect to get hammered just for the purpose of fooling the quote unquote public each and every week. 
So you will hear people say, well, the public is on the Chiefs, therefore I'm taking the 49ers. The public does not play the football game. They do not dictate the outcome. They are not on the field. Players do. Passing offense, passing defense, coaching, things like that matter. And those are the things that dictate who wins and who loses a football game. So it's not really analysis to say what side the public is betting because it does not help you handicap the game. Nobody with a good betting model is tweaking their betting model based on what the public is betting. Just a proxy for actual analysis. You know, if you can't decide, well, I don't, I don't know, let's look at the public's betting. You're not going to have a lot of success by doing that. Now, that's not to say that it, any mention, any reference of public betting splits is going to be irrelevant because let's say I like the 49ers, but a bunch of money is coming in on the Chiefs. I could use that to say, I'm going to wait until later on to bet this because I could get a better number later on. That specifically is fine because it's an attempt to get the best number possible. It doesn't always play out that way because you could see a big bet coming in the Niners and you miss out, but it, predicting market movement is a skill. It's not one I possess personally. Um, I wish I did, but it is a skill. In this game specifically, Niners versus Chiefs, the public was on the Chiefs in a pretty big way. Now, that's not to say that the Sharps were not. There were smart people on both sides of this game. We had Dr. Ed Fang on, and he's one of the people I respect most in the entire betting sphere. And I'd like the Chiefs, plus two and a half. So it's not like it was Sharps versus Squares with this Niners versus Chiefs game. But the large majority of the money was coming in on the Chiefs. That doesn't matter. It does not dictate what happens on the field. So it should not dictate how you bet. Again, what I would ask yourself is, do people with good betting models care about what this about this specific thing that's being discussed? If yes, it's okay to talk about it. It matters then because people with with good models probably are doing the right thing. They're probably winning money and you want to care what they care about. They probably don't care about what the public is betting. Center your analysis around things that help one team win while the other team loses. And if you hear analysis about public betting that is not talking about when to bet a team, it's okay to pause and consider how much weight you want to put into what that person is saying. Because again, we want to focus on the things that actually help dictate who wins a football game and what the public is betting does not dictate that in any way. So yes, there will be times where sports books wind up winning a lot of money where the public is on the opposing side. But you also do have games like last night where the public is heavily on the cheese and sports books get hammered. I mean, that's great because we want the public to win money. We want people to be uh, to, to profit, to, pe to have good times. We want that. Uh, so we should cherish these moments for sure. I, I think it's important to note that public money does not play the game. It does not dictate who wins or who loses. And therefore, it's not something we should focus on when trying to make our bets. Again, timing of bets is different, but actually who to bet, that should not be a factor within your analysis. So that's point number one. Public money should not be a factor in your analysis of who winds up winning a football game, where you want to bet. The second one is about rushing in the playoffs for quarterbacks. In the past few years, we talked a lot about how much more quarterbacks run during the playoffs than they run during the regular season. They're not as protective of their bodies, and it leads to more rushing than what we see during the regular season. This is two impacts. Uh, one is obvious and one is less so. Let's start with the obvious here, is that's we can target rushing props for quarterbacks. And I think preferably we want to go here with alternate markets rather than, you know, going over the baseline number. Example here is Patrick Mahomes. Um, his baseline got jacked up because people were hammering the over because they were aware of this thing. So his baseline rushing prop entering last night was 25 and a half or 26 and a half, depending on when you bet it. He went over that number in two out of four playoff games. So once you account for the hold, if you bet that same number for all four games, you would have lost money. Now, you might not have had the same number for all four, but you get what I'm saying here. You would have lost money if you had bet the same amount all four games of Mahomes to go over 25 and a half or 26 and a half. But he had 41 yards in one game and 66 last night. So if you're betting him to get 30 plus rushing yards, which isn't often offered, but 40 plus is, uh, 40 plus rushing yards, you're in a better spot and you're going to get a better payout on those bets because he can go for big games. Now, you're probably not betting Mahomes for 100 plus because there's not a lot of design rushes outside of what we saw last night. But like for Lamar Jackson, 100 plus, that's that's viable. Josh Allen, you know, 60 plus, that's viable as well. 
So alternate markets are something we should keep looking towards for next year. And it's not just Mahomes. It's Josh Allen. It's Lamar Jackson. Joe Burrow has done this a ton, especially in college. He did during the playoffs there at LSU. I think CJ Stroud will probably be doing this as well. We saw it in that Georgia game when he was in college, ran a bit more in that one, ran a bit in that indie game as well. And I'd love to see it from Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, guys like that too. This will be an angle we can and should keep attacking. So that's the, the first takeaway from quarterbacks rushing during the playoffs is that we should look at rushing mark, and that's pretty obvious. The second part is equally important, though, and it goes back to last night's game. After the 49ers kicked the field goal in overtime, the Chiefs money line was plus 140. Now, I don't know if that was the best price. That's It's hard to line shop in those spots where you're trying to frantically get bets down uh, before markets move, before you know, you're know you worried about latency issues, and like they're already playing and you, you haven't bet it yet. But that's what I got. I got plus 140. In part because I had the 49ers uh, and wanted to lock in a break-even night. And taking the Chiefs up plus 140 did. So I was basically trying to get out of my Niners exposure. And I was able to do that by getting them at plus 140. But the other reason I took them at plus 140 last night live was because I knew that in those gotta-have-it situations, the Chiefs offense can reach a new level. They can run Mahomes and not care about what the consequences may be. They had a fourth and one early on in that overtime drive. Mahomes ran this disgusting triple option, picked up a chunk gain. It was awesome. He had two rushes for 27 yards on the final drive alone. We talked about live betting models with Ed Miller on Friday, and it was a more process-based discussion. So if you didn't hear that episode, I would go back to it because it was a very good forward-looking thing that you can apply to betting, not just the NFL next year, but also apply to betting the NBA. You can apply it to betting baseball at times as well. So I would check out that discussion with Ed, even if you're not, even though we're not betting uh, NFL until uh, September. The betting models, though, as Ed discussed, know the inputs of the two offenses based on pregame markets. They know generally how good the Chiefs are, generally how good the Niners are. But the Chiefs offense in that pregame market is not the same Chiefs offense that we're going to see when they're willing to be that aggressive with Mahomes. So I don't know if plus 140 is a good bet or not in the Chiefs money line. It won, obviously, but doesn't mean it's a good bet. Uh, You can have a bad bet that wins pretty often. But in that spot, I thought the live betting models were undervaluing the Chiefs offense because of what they could lean into that they wouldn't lean into in other spots. In gotta have it situations, they can reach a new level by letting Mahomes run. That does not mean, I want to make this very clear, that does not mean you always live bet underdogs in those situations just because they'll run the quarterback more. But it is something to keep in mind. There are spots where an offense fundamentally changes because of their aggressiveness, and live betting models won't be able to encapsulate that shift because they really do just kind of know what the pregame markets say about these specific games. And I think last night overtime was one of those spots where the Chiefs offense fundamentally changed given the entire situation. And it did present, in my eyes at least, again, I don't know for sure if this is the case, but it did in my eyes present value on betting the Chiefs plus 140 live, knowing that there was a chance the model might, the, the live betting models might not fully account for the new level the Chiefs can reach in situations like that. So key takeaways are, uh, you know, not caring about public money, looking at quarterback rushing props during the playoffs and keeping in mind with live betting, there are situations where an offense reaches a new level that may not be encapsulated by that betting model. The final thing I wanted to discuss is more about the full season than just one game, but it does pertain to last night's Super Bowl too. And we'll get back to what that means in a second or how it pertained to last night's game in a second. But that takeaway is you should bet totals early in the week because the market gets very efficient as the week goes along, even more so than the market for spreads. I've been running my totals model dating back to week 15 of last year. So it's not like a huge sample, but uh, the sample on games that I have in my total model, I'm trying to pull it up here and failing. All right. So I have got a sample of 361 games in my total model. We can look back on, or sorry, divide divide that by two. Um, yes, uh, divide that by two. That's how many number we. So we got about 180 something games in here. We can look at to try to draw some takeaways from. 
So in that time, on Tuesdays, my model is a better mean squared error than the market on Tuesdays. Mean squared error is just tells you how far off you were from being right at the final score, regardless of direction. So if you're three points above, if your total is three points above the final total, it's the exact same as if it was three points below. You're just finding how far off you were, regardless of direction. So my model has been closer to the result on Tuesdays than the market has been. But by game day, the market is better by a good amount. I'm going to give you numbers here. It's okay if you don't know about what these numbers mean or if the numbers kind of fly through your ears. It's okay. I'll I'll tell you what they mean in a second here. But the mean squared error for the market in this time improves from 177.91 on Tuesday to 172.9 on game day. So it improves by five points. Uh, Well, not five, like five in terms of mean squared error, which is a lot in that regard. My market or my model improves from 176.52 to 175.7. So it gets better. And it does improve, but not nearly as much as the market improves. I can beat the market on Tuesday in terms of mean squared error, but I cannot beat the market on Sunday. This is why we do the first look shows on Tuesdays, because I want to allow you to lock in some bets early in the week before these markets get pounded into efficiency. On the markets where, and like I think we can kind of like show the value betting early by looking at my results based on when I place the bet. So or based on whether the market moves with me or against me. If we look at the bets, the total bets that I've made since week 15 of last year, the bets where the market moves against me. So th- I could have gotten a better number later on. My ROI is negative 17.5%. When the market does not move from when I bet it. So I bet it at 47 and a half, I close at 47 and a half. My ROI is negative 1.8. So basically just losing the hold effectively on that market. When I get good movement from a a total that I bet, my ROI is 27.4%. And my overall ROI in totals in this time is positive 8.4%. So you can see there how important it is to get numbers early and hope they move your direction. They won't always. I've only gotten a positive CLV on my bets 63% of the time. That counts it as a 50%, like a half when it stays at me. So like, you know, it's not totally going to be that way, but like, You want to bet early on totals because the market's going to get a lot better and your ROI will be a lot better when you get CLV on totals versus when you don't get CLV or when the number moves against you. If I don't get closing line value on a total that I bet, I'm likely losing money and I don't like losing money. And that actually did happen in this game because I like the over at 47 half points. I had the number at almost 50. Over the weekend, that total went down to 46 and a half. So I was going to lose regardless. It didn't matter if I bet early or late. I was going to lose that over. Well, I guess I would have won the over if I had bet later, but that's not the point here. Uh, but let's talk about it if you like the under. If you like the under, you had to get that bet in before it came down. Otherwise, it was a loss because it landed on 47 exactly. I'm sure a lot of you are getting your bets in early, but in case you aren't, That is a good thing to focus on next year. And again, that's why we do the first look shows on Tuesdays is to try to get ahead of where the markets will move. Try to get your bets in for an upcoming slate as soon as you feel you have good enough information where you can feel good enough about placing that bet. Obviously, you want to account for the fact that like, you know, some things could change. It could move against you or maybe a quarterback gets hurt and that ruins your over stuff like that. That can happen for sure. But you know, I just pointed to the results and those I've had bad situations like that for me as well. This is true for all markets where you want to get in early before you see numbers move, but it's especially true when betting totals because of how good the market is there specifically. Again, the market on Tuesday is beatable. The market on Sunday, at least for me, I'm talking about me specifically. I can't beat that. I don't think at least based on again, my ROI when I bet the closing number is negative 1.8%. So And it's 27.4% if I do get good value, negative 17.5% when it moves against me. So the market is very good at totals, and you want to get those bets in early. And I think that was pertinent last night, but also pertinent more broadly when looking at the total landscape. So again, three takeaways from me from Super Bowl 58 is that public money is not actual analysis. It's a proxy for analysis, and it doesn't help dictate who wins games. So we shouldn't care about it when we're trying to analyze which side we want to bet unless we're deciding when we want to bet that. We should care about rushing quarterbacks in the playoffs, both in terms of betting their player props, but also because it could present live betting opportunities. And finally, you want to bet totals early in the week because 
the market is very, very good at close, as we saw with last night's game, with uh, the final total being a half point off from where that game ended, despite the fact it did go to almost double overtime. So those are my takeaways from last night. They're not gospel by any means, but that's just my my thoughts on what we saw last night and what we saw across this entire 2023 NFL season, which was a blast for me. Hopefully it was a good one for all of you as well. And hopefully you closed things off on a high note last night. I didn't personally, but I hope you did on your end. As mentioned, though, we are still here each and every weekday breaking down. Uh, we're going to be talking basketball, hockey. UFC, NASCAR, golf, all right here in this exact same podcast feed, baseball just around the corner too. So make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Again, if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and you can find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV+. Plus. If you got any questions for me, I'm on Twitter at Jim Saunas. You can find me on threads at Jim Saunas and check out FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across Monday. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow and get our first look at the 2024 NFL Draft. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>